Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Do we have any announcements this morning? Is that an announcement? Yes, Julia. Wonderful. Congratulations. I think for all of us that remember, I remember Trey in a car seat sitting out there in the kitchen window and all of us ooing and eyeing about both boys and, and uh, most of us were part of those boys growing up here. So a milestone. Anybody else? Lewis? It was wonderful, yes. <laughs> A good time was had by all. Anybody else? Dave? Good morning, everybody. Now that you still have your sugar buzz going, for those of you that attended, I'm hoping you'll be a little attentive. We've got an interesting scripture passage this morning. I just have two things just to welcome to our folks watching on YouTube and Facebook, and of course, we're blessed to have another uh, selection sung by our choir this morning. Um, trying out something different, you'll notice our screen is a little bit bigger. Uh, it's a purchase I think we're gonna look at making. Um, let me know what you think this morning. The word should be bigger and clearer. Um, the only thing that could make it better is if we put blinds on the windows, and since we're from Michigan, we are never gonna deny ourselves sun on a winter day. But anyway, hope that's going to look a little bigger and better for you today. And lastly, uh, my office hours will be Thursday from 2 to 5 o'clock, just before our council meeting. So if you want to stop by, you want to call, send me an email, I'd love to see you and uh, chat a little bit and see what's on your mind. Yes? Council is Thursday. It will be at 6 o'clock. Yep. Oh. Because I put it here, I should actually announce it. Pat brought this up. We have a pair of, looks like peepers, reading glasses that somebody left somewhere in Fellowship Hall or our dining room area last night. If you're missing a pair of peepers, uh, see me after the service or just come and grab them here off of the pulpit. Okay, shall we open in prayer? God of our hopes and dreams, we are empty and long to be filled. We are hungry and long to be fed. We are lost and long to be found. Gather us into your love and pick up the pieces of our lives, just as Jesus gathered up the fragments of the five loaves and two fish that remained after feeding the 5,000. Call us anew to eat our fill and to find our true nourishment in Jesus, the bread of heaven. Amen. We ask you to rise now and join me in our call to worship. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. What does God command? To love God. God does not call us to ease or to comfort, but to presence and abundance and grace in our struggle. Let us worship God who believes and abides with us. Let us worship the God who will ask much of us, but will be beside us every step of the way. And now let us join together in singing number 459, O come, O fount of ever, every blessing.
please join me in our confession of sins. O oh Lord, we have not lived our lives as kingdom people. We built our grounds on hopelessness, fear, and selfishness. We are ruled by am I in the right place? We are ruled by our schedules and our need for control. We forget that your kingdom draws near to us on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us, we pray. Come, Come Lord, and, and open, open in us the gates, the gates of, of your, your kingdom. kingdom. Amen. Amen. God blesses and calls us kingdom people. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Invite the choir forward.
It was put in the grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed the loaves to his hearers as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather what you considered left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them, and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. What you can't just read about the feeding of the 5,000, but uh, in relation to what is going to be our second scripture passage in a moment, a little bit about what Jan just read. This account in John is not the only place in the New Testament where we hear about Jesus feeding the 5,000. You can also read about it in Matthew 14, Mark 6, and Luke 9. And as I've said before, usually if you find it in two or three, or let alone four spots in the New Testament, good likelihood that it happens. Maybe the detail was a bit changed, but it likely happened. This is the only miracle that Jesus has that appears in all four Gospels, of course. And so, interesting what's cool, very, very noteworthy about John's account this morning compared to the other Gospels, we hear about grass. We don't hear about grass in the feeding of the 5,000 in the other uh, Gospels. Another unique point in John that Jan read about this morning that Jesus himself that does the feeding in John. We don't really see that elsewhere. So in feeding the people, Jesus sets the stage for a future time that we will have in our faith. And Jan will pick it up here in the very few minutes.
begin the sermon, I'm going to issue my apologies to Larry. Uh, Larry, um, I'm the one to blame because this morning in Sunday school, um, Blakely and I were talking about yeast. She didn't know about yeast, so if you and Sharon get a lot of questions about yeast, I'm to blame. I'm to blame. Blame it on me. But maybe uh, we've got a future bread maker in, in Blakely. Yeah. I think it was around the time that I was 12 years old that I remember learning something interesting about bread. I didn't get it from my home economics class. Did you all have home economics in grade school? Yeah. They should still have that if, if it's been taken away. Learn how to make some really cool ties and be a, even more of an irritant to my mother when she was in the kitchen saying, Mom, you left that out. We learned this. We learned that. Anyways. There were some interesting times that I had with bread. I learned that there were some wonderful varieties besides bunny bread. I don't know if you've ever heard of bunny bread, but in Marquette, where I was born and raised, Doris, you may know something about this, but we had a bakery there called Bunny Bread, and I loved bunny bread because the peanut butter and jelly that got smeared on those loaves were so wonderful. I also like bunny bread because of the fact that at that time, I did not like eggs. I did not like the yellow yolk. And mom said, you got to eat everything on your plate. So that bunny bread must have had plenty of yeast in it because when you sit there and you schmust it together, normally healthy bread to me will kind of go back to its original form. Bunny bread stayed crumpled up. That was a warning sign, warning Will Robinson. There's a lot of yeast or whatever in this bread because it's not coming back to form. But at any rate, I'd crumple up the bunny bread and I'd use it to, to wipe up or eat all of that yolk so I couldn't taste the yolk of the egg when I would eat it. Did that with liver and onions too. At any rate, so bunny bread was my savior in a lot of ways besides just being good stuff for peanut butter. I think the equivalent of it to below the bridge probably would be Wonder Bread. You might all remember Wonder Bread. You also might remember another byproduct of Wonder Bread is like my parents, your parents probably cut out the other end of the plastic uh, bread wrapper and used it to line your shoes so they wouldn't get full of snow when you walked to work. Remember that? Oh yeah, we did that. That was, I don't, I don't think it was just a youper thing. We did it. It was good to have those liners and another good possibility for another sermon. At any rate, I learned that day that there was life beyond bunny bread I learned at that time as well that there could be different kinds of bread. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to taste the delicacy of Swedish cardamom bread. Kind of like basically cinnamon bread. Had a nice sugary sweet taste to it. And from that point I learned there could be dessert bread. I think a lot of us might treat bre uh, cinnamon bread as dessert bread. At least I did early on. The cardamom bread, the equivalent of cinnamon bread was my dessert bread. And what was so interesting about it is during the time of Christmas, my mom would stand in line on one Saturday morning during the Christmas time outside of a church. Not because the sermon was great, but because their congregators were baking some wonderful bread, cardamom bread, lumpa bread. The Lestadian Lutheran Church was just awesome for that Christmas time bread. And that's why my mom stood in line outside of a church. Then, of course, came saffron buns, another Swedish delicacy. Basically, yellow rolls with raisins inside of them and just a little hint of sugar, enough to bring you back. Another dessert bread for kids. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Bread, of course, is a basic staple of life, isn't it? Just like it was for the Israelites thousands of years ago, only for the Israelites, there were no church fundraisers or grocery stores to go to to get their bread from. You either bought it from the market if you had money, but more likely than not, you made it. Lou, this might be a point here where I'm going to ask you to advance the slide. There is a picture in there of what I'm going to talk about next. In an article in Biblical Archaeology Review, a writer by the name of Cynthia Elliott wrote about an experiment she was involved with a long time ago 
in putting together the apparatus that most Israelites likely would have used to bake their bread. It's called a tenur, a tenur. It's a baking bread oven. According to Eliot, the tenur was a beehive shaped clay, and I know it's hard to see with the light and the, the dark background, but it was a beehive shaped clay oven with an opening at the top and at the bottom. They were about 12 to 13 inches high with a 19 inch wide mouth at the top. Of course, you had to cure that clay tenur, and then a few days later, it was ready to go, ready for your bread, made of flour, water, a tiny bit of sugar. And then you took pieces of it. You can't really see it except on the top there. It looks like hamburger, but that's where you would take the dough and you would slap it literally on the side of the clay wall. Only took a few minutes for the dough to turn into ready to eat bread. And so that's the kind of memory, that's the kind of reality that the Israelites were thinking about when they heard Jesus say these words this morning. By the way, the term tenur is found in the Hebrew Bible 15 times, seven of which refer to an oven used to bake bread. Like the, the ancient societies and the people that came before them, the Israelites were dependent on bread, on cereals. So much so, so much so that the word for bread, lechem, is synonymous with food. As the recipients of John's words years ago knew so well, the process of turning grain into flour and then into dough and finally into bread using the tenur was time consuming, not to mention having to construct that oven and maintain it. All right, Lou, if you could put it back on the, on the, the sugary bread and the, the sermon slide. So I know many of you, like the Israelites, are familiar with baking bread, even if we don't make food. That's me. We're still interested, aren't we, in how it's cooked. In his book, Cooked, A Natural History of Transformation, a well-known food author, Michael Pollan, he observes a curious paradox that we have regarding cooking in American culture. We spend less time cooking, but yet we are very interested in each and every preparation, not only from Martha Stewart, perhaps Julia Child is somebody you're familiar with watching about how to cook. In other words, the further we get away from food, both in growing it and cooking it, the more a central role, I think, sometimes we view that it plays in society. With that in mind, we, like the early Christians in John's world who enjoy food and bread, I think want to know more about what Jesus meant when he said today, beginning in verse 35, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Bread of life. Our opening verse features so much material to unpack. It's loaded with a lot of meanings. If we only had to go with just one verse today, I'd pick this one, verse 35, again, our opening verse. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Never be thirsty. Putting ourselves in the minds of the early Christians who hold those words, perhaps they went right to, and again, John is writing to an early Christian community about 70 years after Jesus died. They likely knew about the word bread, lechem, of course, but they knew that it was associated with communion, for we know the early Christians were likely practicing communion in those house churches by sharing a meal and a drink with each other, much like Jesus did with his closing hours and his closest friends before he was arrested. Of course, we remember our communion practices, right? In the words of institution, last Sunday, this is my body given for you, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. So as we think of those words in communion, we are reminded yet again of how we are joined with each other and people across the globe in brotherhood and sisterhood at one table with Jesus during communion. 
We have that solidarity, that close-knit feeling, don't we, when we're at communion? Just like we are around our family ho holiday gatherings, right? I mean, we are food people. We love to get together, case in point, last night. Yes, it was all desserts. Yeah, there was some bread in the form of pastries and different things and crackers, but we are foodies. There is that communion with each other as well as with Jesus. Bread, of course, as we've already talked about, is something that the Christians knew was not only part of their daily lives, but their history. If you, Jesus, when he spoke about bread, the early Christians might have thought about to the stories they heard from their family members about the Exodus story and God bringing the Israelites away from slavery in Egypt and wandering in the wilderness. We've talked about the Exodus story, and you remember it's about maybe four Sundays ago, maybe more than that, where they were wandering in the wilderness and they didn't have bread. But they were fed by the manna in the wilderness, those little dew drops that came down overnight and helped give them the ingredients to make bread and to have water, the gift of manna from heaven. So by saying, Jesus, with those words, I am the bread of life, Jesus was reiterating to them that God still provides food just like God did to their relatives in the wilderness. Jesus, God, the bread of life. So with that little history lesson this morning, Jesus plays it forward. In our opening verse, of course, there is more meaning to Jesus than just being the bread of life and never thirsting, right? We know that. Jesus, in, those opening, in that opening verse, gives us, peels back his identity some more for us to find out. In these early moments of his ministry in John, he utters those two words that, of course, we've heard before. I am. I am. He says it four times in our scripture passage this morning. In other words, we know what Jesus is, but we know what God is, right? I am. I am. Those same words that Moses said, heard from God in the burning bush. When Moses asked God, what is your name that I should reveal to the power brokers in Egypt? And God, of course, said, I am what I am. So in saying I am, Jesus reveals again where he came from, the I am, the God. But what Jesus doesn't say this morning that I think is worth mentioning is he's not promising us that we're not going to have problems in life or suffer hardship. But in saying those words, I am, and I am the bread of life, and we will never hunger and thirst, Jesus is saying we will always have God and Jesus in our midst, in the good times and in the bad times. In our opening verse as well, the I am claim is also expanded. That is, to come to Jesus and believe in him creates faith. Faith in him. Faith in God. In other words, John is showing here in these opening moments of Jesus' ministry and to his Christian community the early roots of faith. To believe in Jesus is to have faith. The early beginnings of faith coming together right before our eyes. Also, Jesus in saying, I am, he's associating his own identity with the bread, the bread of life. And with believing, believe in Jesus, believe in God. In saying also, I am, Jesus is expanding his identity to another horizon, on a new level, which I think to the critics that were listening to him, including the Jewish religious officials, it was a little troubling for them. Because in saying, I am, Jesus was making clear to the religious critics of his time that he is the Messiah, the one that everybody has talked about that would come in the Old Testament and who would be sent by God. Of course, the religious officials of that time had a different view, and they weren't buying it. And it would get worse in terms of their criticism on that point later in Jesus' ministry. We then have before us verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Let's linger on those words for a moment. Come down 
from heaven. And remember, we're in the opening moments of Jesus' ministry. People have never heard these words before in the early John Christian community. I have come down from heaven. In those words, Jesus is saying God's kingdom has finally come to terra firma, to earth, the holiest present in God, in Jesus, rather. The holiest present in Jesus, God incarnate, otherwise known as the I am. The word has now come to the people through Jesus. The holy intersects now at heaven and earth in one point in those early moments of Jesus' ministry outlined by John. Here's something else that's not really stated clearly, but nevertheless lurks in the background of this verse 38. Jesus came down from heaven to make God visible and reach everyone for the very first time in human history. That's momentous. That's a little mind-blowing. There is God standing before the people in Jesus. That's never happened before. Momentous. So God is now visible and in reach for all. And that faith in Jesus, as we hear in verse 38, is impossible, impossible without God coming to earth in Jesus. And in saying those words, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me, Jesus was also making it clear this. We have a response to God coming down to earth and being incarnate, God being incarnate in Jesus. We have a response. Our response of God coming to earth is to do, do, do the work, implement the teachings and all of the commands given us by Jesus. And then we have verses 39 and 40 with some very interesting words. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all of those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day, the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. What's also remarkable in John this morning, and we heard it in these words that Jan read, is that for the first time in John, and in these verses, as well as verse 44 that comes later, we hear a promise of eternal life. Life eternal for us on the last day. The last day. In other words, we have this life, and then the life, of course, we know this that is to come but now it will come when Jesus comes, when Jesus ascends to earth and raises the living from the dead. This is huge for those folks that heard Jesus say those words. And of course, they're huge for us, and we should never forget that. Here we have these words, these first words from Jesus. For at that time, we need to remember with John and his community, Jesus had not come yet. So what do you say? What do you say when Jesus hasn't come yet, as promised? But the promise, my friends, still remains. The bread that came down from heaven means that the promise of heaven now exists for everybody, all believers. Heaven and earth are no longer locations, but a truth about God's character. And here's what is so Wonderful that God's presence is now wherever we are. Wherever any believer is, God is present. Biblical scholar Carolyn Lewis made this interesting observation that has stayed with me. She said, and I agree with this, keeping in mind the role bread played in what Jan read about the feeding of the 5,000. Bread is what eternal life looks like. That's what Jesus is also saying this morning. What eternal life looks like. A bread and an eternal life that looks forward and not just backwards. Eternal life, as we look at that bread, 
gives us the certainty of provision, right? When we have plenty of food, we have provision, lots of food in the cupboard. But now in that symbol of the bread, it communicates us that we have certainty of being fed forever. We have enough nourishment. It's always going to be there for us in good times and bad. And that promise that we will have eternal provision in that bread and what Jesus carries forward all the time for our grandkids, for our kids. All you have to do is believe. And what one gains when one believes, Jesus makes clear this morning, is eternal life and resurrection on the last day of our lives here on earth. Jesus essentially looks forward and backwards today and he communicates to us that our faith in Jesus shows us our present life and the one to come. Related to our promised resurrection by Jesus that we hear about in John this morning are some more important words that are in verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up on the last day. Interesting words. Unless the Father who sent me draws them, us, and I will raise us, people, on the last day. In these words, in bold and big text, we should underline them. We have a choice when Jesus says, says these words. God naturally draws us closer to Jesus Christ. Naturally does that. God brings us, makes us go ever so close to Jesus, but we've got to take the last step, don't we? We've got to make the extra effort and go across the finish line and get closer to Jesus. God invites us to a relationship with Jesus. Yes, Jesus invites us, but here Jesus is saying, God says, come closer to Jesus. Invites us closer to Jesus so we can have that relationship. We can walk through the door and begin to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that can lead to eternal life, but we also can choose to ignore that door, don't we? And not go through that door. Jesus in his word says this, God leaves it up to us to come to Jesus. All right, I'm going to tell you something you don't already know, you know already, but it still bears worth mentioning. We're here in this place because we already have a relationship with Jesus Christ and we want to nurture it, right? We want to maintain it. The key word here is maintain, maintain. For we know that we do stray. We sin. Sin represents a broken relationship that we have with Jesus, caused by evil, or sometimes we get distracted and we're drawn to something else. And then we stray. We stray away from Jesus. Perhaps we're strayed, we stray because of materialism or greed. But Jesus is the bread of life. He's at the table all the time waiting for us to come back always waiting for us to come back and walk through the door and begin anew any broken relationship we have with Jesus and sit at the table once more and establish that relationship with him. Finally, we look at verse 46 in these words. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. With these words, Jesus makes it clear to believers and non-believers that are there before him and us here today that when we look at Jesus, we see God. We see God. I know this is elementary, but I really think it's important to just stop for a moment and think about that and soak up this fact. Want to know what the divine looks like? Here it is, the bread of life, Jesus. Want to know how God talks while God is on earth? Look at Jesus. This is what the bread of life looks like. This is important, and that's why John, of course, writes about it, since the people living before him, still waiting for Jesus to come. They know that he died. We know he's been resurrected. But in the meantime, they have bread to focus on the reminder of Christ in their midst. So as you leave today and every time you have a poppy seed muffin, chocolate chip muffin, or 
three-day-old Meyer submarine sandwich bread, I always remember Jesus and the bread of life. The presence of Jesus, the visible presence of Jesus, not just lurking in our midst or working and walking through other people around us, but visibly in our midst in that bread. Whether we are eating cardamom bread or saffron buns, cinnamon bread or a simple roll for dinner, can we always remember that God is always present? Always present. And it is Jesus that nourishes us with bread, nourishes our heart, nourishes our soul, and enriches our life, less the yeast, enriches our lives in the here and now. This is what someone observed is a relational nourishment that we have with Jesus Christ, a relational nourishment. Bread is our reminder of that. Bread symbolizes that eternal life begins in our relationship with Christ and continues from this life into the next. And since we are all made in the image of God, and of course God incarnate in Jesus Christ, we are not only to nourish our relationship with Christ, but to continue nourishing that relationship we have with God and Jesus and how we think and act and help and speak with people around us, people we know and people we don't know. The relationship with God and the relationship to other Christians and others, whether they're Christians or not, is what nourishes our souls in the very end. Think about that when you've always helped someone. That is nourishment. That's that relational nourishment I'm talking about. The prayers and the music and the service today remind us of our connection with God through Jesus. Our ministries like Lakata and the food pantry remind us that relationships with others enrich our lives as well as give glory and satisfaction to the one who is the bread and bread of life. Let's now sing two verses of Peace Like a River. I've got peace like a river. Thank you for the wonderful music again of the choir and Brewer, thank you for getting me through the proper way to list those words <laughs> these two hymns this one in particular today good good music peace like a river let us pray god this morning we gather we gather to focus on the bread of life your son jesus who came down before us and showed us what you look like, how you talk, and what you want for us. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice, Lord, in all the blessings that we continue to have as your people. We thank you for the wonderful gathering around food and bread last night, and Pat and Dennis and their families, and for everybody that came here, had a good time in fellowship. We sensed your presence here last night as we gathered to remember 
Valentine's Day, but also the bread of life that we always have with you. We thank you for our blessings. We also ask you, as we know, as we look into the bread and see that that is your visible presence, to especially let your presence be with us on our longest days and our darkest nights. We pray for those that are suffering in our midst, our family and friends that might be dealing with illnesses or the pandemic or full of anxiety over whatever. Please be and walk with those people and comfort them in their darkest times. Lord, we ask you to be with the peacemakers across the globe in our hot spots. We especially are worried about the ongoing crisis between Ukraine and Russia, and we ask for peace to prevail and not war. We pray for the people of Ukraine, for the people that are at the border with Russia. Again, let peace prevail. Let peace prevail everywhere on earth. God, we also rejoice and mark February as we celebrate Black History Month in the United States. We thank you for the sacrifices that have been made for racial justice and for civil rights for Martin Luther King and so many others. But we know we need to do more work in this area. More work. All lives matter because we are all joined together as brothers and sisters in this world. Lord, we pause now and pray to you either silently or out loud our own prayers and petitions. For Noah and for Barb, Lord, as you have heard our prayers and petitions, we ask you to hear us now as we say together the prayer from the one who said he is the bread of life. We say together, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you join me in saying our offering dedication? God, we ask you to bless our offering and the work it will support. Let these brie gifts bring your word to life in the world. May our giving, our living, and our loving be acceptable to you in your sight. Amen. Now would you please rise? Let's sing our closing hymn. It is number 301, Crown with your riches, Crown, we'll sing three verses. Well, then we're going to do four. crowns the lamb upon the throne. 
risen Savior brings your thanks for life made new. Crown Christ who have known down hands and feet aside. Look past the peak of Calvary's row to Christ the glorified. The sun that lights the sky is gray before the sky. Crown Christ the truth, the life who triumphed o'er the grave and rose victorious in the strife this fallen world to save christ's glories now we sing christ's name we magnify who died eternal life to bring and lives that death made on Crown Christ who holds the years, embracing space and time. Or of the rolling spears, the sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for you have died for me. Allow me to send you away with this blessing. May we always, wherever we may be, with bread before us, to know that God is before us, Christ is before us, and Christ is with us always. Go now, my friends, to love and serve the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.